did you remember to lock the doors? <laughs> This is an experience my mum and dad had that happened in December of 2018. They were coming back home from eating out and pulled into their driveway and parked. The area where they live is moderately wooded and on a large plot of land about 20 acres. They got out of their car and started to walk up to the door when they heard a blood curdling scream coming from only 10 feet away from them. Not only was the scream terrifying but it was extremely loud. My dad is a state trooper and served in the US Marine Corps, so not much will actually scare him. He's the guy to watch a horror movie at 3 a.m. with all the lights off and curtains open. However, that night, he said he was genuinely terrified. They snapped out of their trance and ran inside, and he came back out with his gun. He got in his patrol car and started checking out the area. He shined his spotlight down into the pasture and around the property, but couldn't find anything. The fact that he did this is alarming because he would never pull a gun out if he was joking, which he has done multiple times. I've only seen him actually pull a gun out two other times in my life. And this isn't the only experience. Only about a week after I came back home from college for winter break, I sat on the front porch late one night drinking coffee, it was pretty cold, and reading a book when I heard something eerie coming from the pasture to the east of my house. It sounded like creaking, but there was no wind blowing, and I know the area clearly, and there wasn't a hanging branch or anything for that matter that would justify the sound. Even though it creeped me out, I refused to think anything of it, and brushed it off as strange but explainable. Thoroughly chilled, I stopped reading my book because of bad lighting and went inside. After a while, I found that I forgot my book outside and went out again to grab it. This time, I heard a low, poor howl. The only canine creatures that live around their place are coyotes. And when you hear them, it's a mixture of yips and short, pitchy howls. Hearing it and having my fears proved that it was some otherworldly being, I grabbed my book and ran inside. About 20 minutes later, my brother comes home from a friend's house. He walks in and doesn't say anything other than hey. I tell him what I experienced, because we have all experiences that we tell each other to creep each other out. To my surprise, he said he heard the same thing just a couple of minutes earlier when he was walking outside. The sound had moved from its previous location southwest of my position and was now in the northwest corner of the property. He said that the sound was a long, deep but poor or weak, kind of like the one I had heard. My brother seemed more spooked with his encounter than I did with mine. He said that the duration was just so long and then sounded very fake like a poor imitation. After that, there wasn't any more sightings the entire time I was home. It's since been ruled out as deer, since we have a lot of them, and they make some really strange noises. But after reading through this subreddit, I feel like it may be a skinwalker issue, or something of the sort. We do live near a spot where the Native Americans hold their powwows, and there is a house in our neighborhood that is built on a Native American burial ground, allegedly. So it wouldn't be a surprise that this may be the case. I have other experiences with some strange sounds and being whistled at in the dark of night, but no sightings so far. I live near a very large, very popular national park. Locals here like myself, are pretty aware of the goings-on near here. Strange sounds, strange creatures, and strange disappearances. I have dealt with these myself in the past on hikes and even just relaxing in the park. 
here is one that still freaks me out to this day. I was at my grandma's house that's deep in the boonies. The only road to there is a gravel road that is pretty much washed away. So without a good car, you're not getting out there anyways. My cousins lived in a trailer with their mums right below my grandma's. We played all sorts of games, which mainly involved me getting chased. I was the youngest. My grandma was in the hospital with my aunt, so our older cousin, who all named Denny, had to watch us. Denny was, and still is, the only cousin that's older than us that we still hold in high regards. He would mess around with us and play around, but actually cared about us. The whole day we spent playing around, but we would usually play more at night, like hide and seek, tag, etc. We had been playing pretty far away from the house, and it was starting to get dark. We decided to go back to the house and grab flashlights and play manhunt. Of course, I was the only one being hunted. I ran pretty far into the woods on the other side of the property, and hid behind a log. I heard my cousins getting closer, so I ran, and they saw me. We ended up running to the very back of the property line, almost a mile from the house. And we saw my cousin, Denny. He looked at us and kind of growled, and we all ran from him, thinking it was a game. We ran back onto the gravel road and we saw him walk out of the tree line, but he did it weirdly, kind of gloatingly in a way. We ran into the house and decided to barricade the door to play a prank on him. We moved a couple of things in front of the door, but decided to move the big coffee table in front of it too. As we loudly scooted the table across the floor, Denny came into the living room from the master bedroom, rubbing his eyes. We had obviously woke him up from all the movement and he was mad. We told him about seeing him chase us, and he got wide-eyed. He told us to go to our bedroom and stay there. We sat in the bedroom for about 20 minutes, and he came in and told us not to worry, that it was just him scaring us, and we went on with the night. It wasn't until about three years later, when I was 13, that he told me the truth. It was a skinwalker. He told me that he has dealt with it when he was our age, and told me his story, which I may share as well someday, depending on how far this goes. This, of course, is just one story. There's loads more. Some background. I live in a very religious place in the south, so a lot of people tend to not believe what they hear or see, because it's just the devil playing tricks. That being said, my cousin Denny who is about 12 years older than me, believes in this too. That what he saw was just a demon and not a skinwalker. Getting this story out of him took a while. He didn't like to talk about it, but I got him to open up about it a bit. This happened around the mid 90s. Denny, much like me and my cousins, spent his childhood around my mama's property with his brother, Charlie, and his cousin, Ken. They would play manhunt and tag and such, like we did. When this story took place, it was in the middle of the summer, and he was around 12. He and Charlie and Ken were playing at a treehouse that is no longer standing. They had just pulled a prank on Ken and were hiding from him in the treehouse. Denny and Charlie stayed in the treehouse until Ken stopped looking. Charlie left and went back into our mama's house and left Denny alone. Denny stayed up in the treehouse and read some comics. The treehouse was about half a mile from the house and was on a hill so that you could still see the house from it, but it was still in the woods. At the time, my papa was still alive, but was in Georgia on a retreat, so he was not there, which let the three boys to do whatever they wanted. Pawpaw would holler for them to come in when it started to get dark, because there was, and still is, a large number of coyotes and bears around the house. Denny decided to read comics all day, something he still enjoys, 
and eventually fell asleep. He woke up and it was dusk. He heard our Momo yelling for him and he began to get ready to leave. As he went down the ladder, he heard a coyote yip and he climbed back up. At this point, he began to get a little upset while telling me the story. He began to explain what the coyote looked like and I realized it was the same one that me and my cousins had seen growing up as well. It looked like it had mange. It had a large tuft of fur missing on its right side and you could see the bare pale skin and it had human like eyes. It snarled at him and bore its teeth. He was taken aback by this and he just sat back down in the treehouse. The coyote sat at the base of the ladder and just looked up at him. He told me that he sat there for about 20 minutes trying to figure out what to do. He remembered he had a slingshot and decided that the best course of action would be to try and scare it off with that. He said he shot at it and it just growled more. My cousin was and still is a very good shot with a slingshot. I had a couple of bruises to prove it. He reared back and decided to aim at its eyes because he didn't like the way it stared at him. He reared back and got it right in his left eye. It ran away, yowling. At this point in the telling, Denny was getting a little more emotional. He told me that he climbed down the ladder and made a mad dash towards the house. About halfway to the house, there is a large dip in the land where there are a bunch of bushes and small trees. When he was about there, he told me that he heard coyote yips all around him and swore that a whole pack had come upon him. He just ran from it and while he was on his way up the other side of the dip, he tripped and hurt his leg. By now, Denny had started to get upset and had to stop a few times. He told me he got up and started to limp towards the house. This is the part that gave me the chills. He told me he turned and looked behind him and saw not a coyote anymore, but a person. And it looked like it had his face. He said it started to walk toward him in an odd way. But luckily, Charlie and Ken started yelling for him and as quickly as it appeared, it disappeared. Denny told Charlie and Ken, but they didn't believe him, and they told him it was just a trick of the night, something that he still tries to believe in. As soon as he told me this, he asked me kindly not to ask him about it anymore, as when he thinks about it, he thinks he sees that coyote outside. Denny is a very religious and reliable man, so when he says weird stuff is happening, I usually believe him. The coyote he saw that night, me and my cousins have seen before as well, along with the stag. Since the night me and my cousins saw it, I've had two more encounters, the latest one being last year. To start with, I'm a white female. I was adopted seven years ago by another Navajo family and we've always been close, despite obvious cultural differences. Still, I learned about skinwalkers firsthand, and they've since become an accepted part of my life. I have a ton of skinwalker stories, but I will start off with just a few. The first happened to my adopted uncle. He lives in Blanding, Utah, a spot not quite notorious for skinwalkers, but full of them nonetheless. He was driving through the canyon area at night, and got that familiar feeling. It was dark outside, but the moon illuminated the canyon and the brush enough for him to see out of his peripheral vision that something was running across the desert night. He was in his 40s at the time and a police officer. He started singing in Navajo and kept his eyes on the road in front of him. But he was driving at least 55 to 60 miles per hour, so the shape running through the desert was keeping pace with him, despite his high speed. He said that it looked vaguely human shaped, but paler than any human he'd ever seen. Still, he didn't look directly at it, and despite his singing, he was getting more and more scared. What my Navajo family always taught me was that these creatures feed on your fear. This one certainly seemed to. 
My uncle was shaking and sweating when the running thing picked up speed, outpacing his truck. And then, when it was maybe 30 yards ahead of him, it made a sharp right and began to run toward the road. He knew it was going to directly intersect him, and he made up his mind to put his foot on the gas, because being broken down in the middle of the road, in the dark, alone, was a death sentence. As it got closer, he sped up, and just as they were about to cross paths, it jumped onto the road. He saw it for the first time then. He described it as a skinny man in jeans and a plaid shirt, with a long face and big yellow eyes, much like cat's eyes. Its arms were thrown up over its head, and its hands kind of flying out behind it. The worst part was that its mouth was open and seemed to be disconnected from its jaw. His chin was just flapping around, about a foot below his nose. It leapt onto the road, and then, just as quickly, jumped out of the way of his truck. He didn't see it again. He prayed the whole way home, and they had a ceremony shortly after that. Another encounter happened to my adopted brother, who is one of the most level-headed and unshakable men I've ever met. He was 30 when this happened. He was at his dad's house, partaking in one of their ceremonies, which happens in a Hogan. The rule is that you never leave the Hogan alone, because the magic and the energy that you make during these ceremonies is kind of like a supernatural light beacon, and you never know what kind of creatures you're attracting. Still, Eric, my brother, was a pretty rational guy who wasn't afraid of the dark. He'd been in the Hogan for hours, chanting and praying, and needed a smoke break and to take a leak. So, against the general rule, he edged out of the roundhouse and out into the night. There was nothing around except for 15 to 20 parked cars, all close to the ceremony area. It was a large gathering, so Eric did his business with no incident and lit up a cigarette. He was standing there, staring off into space, when he got that feeling of being watched. To shake it off, he walked away from the Hogan, about 20 feet, and scanned the desert. Everything was quiet, except for the drums coming from the tent and the singing within. Just as he was about to shrug off this weird feeling and chuck his cigarette butt, he saw it. Under one of the vehicles, a dark shape and two shining eyes. The eyes were like animal eyes. They didn't glow on their own, but they had reflective light in them. They glinted right at Eric. They were yellow. The creature didn't really have the shape of any animal he recognized, though he explained to me that it was shaped like Gollum, really skinny, with a round human head. Eric, not scared of something that would make most wet their pants instantly, walked towards the vehicle and bent down to get a closer look. Dust scrabbled around, and he could hear a skittering noise. Bony arms shoved some gravel his way, and the next thing he knew, the creature was gone, and the vehicle was empty. But then he smelled this disgusting, puke-worthy stench, and he got scared then, because in Navajo culture, Bad smells are taken very seriously when they're assumed to be supernatural. So he straightened back up, and then he realized the source of the smell. A shadow fell over him, covering him from behind, and he's around 6'2", so this thing, he said he estimated at 7.5 feet at least. He was shivering, and didn't move as it approached him from behind, until it was standing inches away. He could feel it smell it, see its shadow, and the worst thing, he felt it breathe on his neck. Eric said that it sounded like a horse or a cow when it snorts, and its breath was warm. When he looked at his feet, he saw his own shoes, and behind his right foot, a big hoof. So he closed his eyes and started to sing. Right at that moment, his dad and uncle got a terrible feeling from inside the Hogan. They bolted up and exited, 
calling his name. They found him shivering outside, too terrified to talk, and too terrified to stop singing in Navajo. It took Eric months before he shared this with us, and he did so, expecting us to laugh or call him crazy. But I completely believe his story. This happened to my older brother, who we can call David. He was back in the early 2000s and he was a senior in high school in a small podunk Utah town. Being a senior and a football player, he kind of fit the stereotype and did stupid things. One of which included walking through the woods late at night, as he put it, to throw rocks and terrorize kids from school. Yes, immature I know. But he and his accomplice, another Navajo called Sean, who were both seniors on the football team, chose the woods for their antics because cops patrolled the streets and there was a city curfew in place. The route they took went through a skate park, which was rich in Navajo artifacts and even had a kiva, which you could go down into. So one night, they were sneaking through the forest before the sun had risen and they had started to stop and shush each other because they could sometimes hear footsteps in the distance. Unless some other football geniuses had the same idea to walk through the desert, there should have been no one else out there. This continued for a while, until Sean stopped abruptly. David grabbed him and said, get down. They dropped to their stomachs, heads down, listening. The footsteps crunching through the dry desert foliage were now accompanied by mumbling. David estimated that the sounds were maybe a hundred feet away at first, but then got closer. He couldn't tell if the mutterings were in Navajo, English, or some other language. After the noises remained fairly distant for a while, Sean whispered without looking, it sounds like a drunk. Several more minutes passed, and David decided to chance a peek as the noises seemed more distant now. It was night but the moon was bright, casting light off the nearby canyon walls. David was expecting to see a man, but instead he saw a figure which moved with a tilt to its body and was long and tall. It was human formed and walked on two feet but was misshapen and very tall, resembling maybe a cocopelli or a Navajo patina doll not a normal shape in any case. As it mumbled and drifted through the trees, seemingly in search of something, David was captivated, watching it for a few minutes. And then, suddenly, the snapping of twigs and muttering stopped. Everything went quiet, and the figure, whatever it was, had disappeared. After that, David and Sean both felt that whatever had been in the forest was gone. They sat on the ground afterwards, discussing what had just happened. Sean asked about what David had seen, and then stated, I didn't look because if I would have, it would have known we were both staring. I forgot to ask him if he and Sean went back through the woods. The answer is probably yes. This kind of incident is pretty common within Navajo culture, and it's something they're used to dealing with. Personally, I would have bolted myself. So I live in San Juan County, on the Utah side. I was with some friends and we wanted to party. My friend said her boyfriend had alcohol, so we went to his house. We ended up in this place on the reservation, in the middle of nowhere by a shack and found him and his dog asleep in a ditch. The first thing I noticed was that there were bones everywhere. Next, the dog got up, but it rose in a really creepy manner. I've never been afraid of any dog ever, but the way this one got up gave me the chills. It was super skinny and looked like it had mange because its fur was patchy and its skin looked leathery. Its eyes appeared human and it kept balancing on its back legs, 
or crouching over. The whites of its eyes were red while the irises were brown. Next, the guy got up. He was really sketchy. At first, we thought he was just drunk, but he was acting incredibly strange. As soon as he got in the car, it reeked like actual death, as if he smelled rotten and foul. We had to roll the windows down. He was wearing baggy clothing and four different jackets. We'll call him Bruce. He was talking incoherently and kept yawning while he spoke. But he seemed to walk mostly normal, except he had a weird limp that made him sway with every step. It turned out he didn't have any drinks, but we had already arrived, so we went to get another friend that we knew. We'll call him Alex. Alex has alcohol, but we had no place for a party, so Bruce said he knows a spot. We let Bruce guide us back to the reservation and to a really sketchy trailer a few miles away from where we initially picked him up. The dog was there, waiting for us. At this point, I just wanted to go home, because the whole scenario was giving me awful vibes, and everything in my body was telling me I needed to leave. I'm not a superstitious person at all, but Bruce's girlfriend was my ride home, so I had no other choice. I decided at that moment that I wasn't going to drink or do drugs with them because of the circumstances. We got out of the car and the creepy dog comes straight to me, knocks me down and starts trying to dry hump me. But he got the dog off me immediately though and I ran into the abandoned trailer. Some of the windows were broken and everything was old and dusty. The carpet was torn up and there was no furniture except for some lawn chairs. I took a seat. I overheard Bruce whisper to Alex that he has some spice. My three other friends then get into the trailer with me and start taking shots of alcohol. Then Bruce whips out a bowl to smoke something. My friends asked what it was and he says it's weed. They start smoking and it doesn't smell like weed at all. I look at it under the flashlight and realize it is indeed spice and try telling them that it's not weed and that we should probably leave. They make fun of me, take more shots and more hits. I look out the window and see the creepy dog crawling or running around the trailer. Alex at this point is pretty drunk and he starts yelling at Bruce for killing his dad a few days prior. Bruce gets flustered and leaves with his girlfriend. A few minutes later, the dog tries to open the door with its paws. It doesn't succeed, but I could see it trying since the door had a window. I got really scared because this dog was not normal and was just staring at me through the glass. I start sharing my location with a few people in case something wrong happens. Alex is crying about how Bruce murdered his dad on the reservation and that he can't bring himself to forgive Bruce for what he's done. They're apparently close cousins. I just wanted to go home. Bruce returns with his girlfriend and a fight breaks out. So we all leave Bruce and his dog at the trailer. Then Bruce's girlfriend randomly has a psychotic episode as we get back to town and decides she wants everyone else in the car to walk home. She screams at them to get out and they all walk over a mile to get to their homes. She drops me off for some reason without saying a word. When I get home I check my phone and find that my friends were scared because something kept throwing rocks at them on their way back. Anyways, I'm convinced that this was an experience with a Yinadlushi or Skinwalker or something. Everyone there was Navajo except for me, if that makes any difference. I know it's cheesy and trite writing, but it was actually really scary, and I was crying on the way back home. I don't know how to describe how the dog walked, but it was not normal. Anyways, I might just be paranoid, but everything about the situation was honestly just so scary and weird that I felt like I needed to share it with someone and see what their thoughts were. I've been terrified and home, unable to sleep because even if it wasn't a skinwalker, it was a murderer who probably hadn't showered since the murder and also he had a creepy ass dog.
Hello watchers and listeners, thank you so much for watching. If you have a story to share, please send it to my email in the description below. This channel is mostly made up of stories sent in by viewers or people they know. Another way to support the channel is to sign up for my Patreon where you can watch my videos ad free. More perks will be added in the new year. Also I will be adding new designs to the merch store, so keep an eye out for that. Thank you all for your continuous support, and remember, Papa loves you.